where I'm pretty sure we're going to have some big reveals here with uh, GDOE Superintendent John Fernandez. Good morning, John. Good morning. Uh, what, what reveals are we talking about? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just building a suspense, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, um, there's a lot going on. And yeah. So uh, you'll, you'll have to have to work towards that. But um, no, I was up this morning and, we, we, you know, we have a... Um, they, they never they never schedule these conferences on Guam time, right? It's always like Eastern Standard Time. So you know we're up at two in the morning trying to uh, join and also trying to look uh, decent enough to uh, participate. But I was very happy to join uh, the chief the Council of Chief State School Officers meeting and uh, hear for the first time the uh, the U.S. Secretary of Education kind of a, you know come out publicly and address uh, the state superintendents across. Uh, the country, and so it was very encouraging. A very, you know, very inspiring. Uh, he, he, he's a former state superintendent. This is Miguel Cardona. Um, he has uh, comes out of Connecticut, the state uh, a state superintendent, but also, you know, served as a assistant superintendent and a principal and a teacher uh, in his community. But um, you know, again, the focus for the country is, which is what we need to hear. The focus on, uh, you know, for the president and for the department is. To help us get to a point where we can reopen schools for more of our kids to come back to class and uh, that's been our effort uh, but you know it has to move in tandem with all the public health strategies it has to move in tandem with the resources that are being made available to accomplish those goals and i think uh, we're starting to see a lot of that come together uh, nationally uh, which is which helps us locally so um, i think if there is any reveal this week uh, it was revealed to us on monday uh, which is you know two things. One is the CDC uh, changed its guidance pretty pretty quickly. I mean, I think last week I talked to you about a study that had been done, and CDC was going to review it. And of course, being a federal agency, I said it's going to take a month just to uh, you know do the complete the first review and discuss it, and then maybe a next, uh, they'll look for another study. So we were pretty surprised to hear that the momentum was so. Um, you know, was so quick to to read, review, and then make a determination. Uh, so that the CDC issued guidance this weekend to reduce the six foot distancing requirement to, uh, for the most part, to three feet uh, within the classrooms, and that really um, addresses you know the heart of um, you know our challenges in terms of returning kids to school. Uh, as I told you before, you know, with six feet distancing in place, we can only get forty percent of our kids back into the classroom at any one day uh, at any one time so with at three feet we're getting much much closer to you know essentially the pre-covid uh, you know levels right and so uh, we're going you know that that was one um, that announcement the other announcement was one that the governor made which uh, also you know supports uh, our efforts which is to open up vaccinations for the 16 year olds and above so you know they've been doing this gradual incremental broadening of the eligibility requirements but you know we, we all we all know that um you know there hasn't been a real rush by everybody to you know to come and get their vaccines and so i, I think it was a good decision to go ahead and throw the doors open so that those members of the community who do want to go and have been waiting to go get their vaccines um can, can go do that now of course i thought this would happen in april for the 16 year old <laughs> but you know, great. It's really great. I mean, it was it was announced, and of course, immediately we know that a lot of students. Um, you know, you know, we saw it in the just in the media. A lot of uh, 16, 17 year olds showed up on day one to to get their uh, vaccines. I have a 16 year old. She's interested in doing that as well. And um, and I and I, you know, we're going to do our best. We we had a conversation with public health and said, if there's anything we can do to facilitate vaccinations for students uh, who are interested but may have transportation issues. Um, you know, let us, you know, let's, let's figure that out. Uh, but that, that'll help us, you know, uh, as part of our um, reopening strategies, because of course, as you know, uh, it's not just about fitting, you know, people in the classroom. It's also about make, making sure we maintain a safe environment. And even though the studies show that our young kids, uh, you know, our, our smaller kids don't have, you know, have a lower risk of transmission, once you get to the adult sized, you know, students, um, you know, that's, that's where you have to be careful. And so I'm glad that, that uh, we're, they made that decision. Um, but they did it, you know, we were in the middle of a parent forum, you know, on Monday night when they made that announcement. So we went ahead and broke the news, you know, during the middle of that parent uh, meeting. And 
And uh, but just to let them know that that's making us go back to the drawing board to readjust uh, our plans. And um, you know, we'll, we'll have those discussions, you know, as you know, this week with the board and and, and going forward as to how those plans will be adjusted. There was, though, I thought somewhere in the the guidance from public health that uh, you're right, the the th going from six feet to three feet in the in the classroom. But there was something I saw where you would still have to maintain uh, six feet. Um, right. Yeah. the The guidance is not three feet universally, you know, on on all the school campuses. So I mean, if you get into the details, it's three feet between students in the classroom. It's six feet between all the adults and the and between adults and students, because you know the I think based on the the evidence that uh, was being reviewed by CDC, if there is transmission within the schools, it's more likely happening from adult to adult, and not from student to student or from student to adult. So uh, for for adults, we still have to maintain that six foot distancing as much as possible. And then uh, in addition to that, when you're in the cafeteria in the gym. Uh, you know, when, when face masks might not be, you know, uh, used or where there is higher uh, possibly probability of, you know, of, you know, more exhalation, like, you know, you're breathing hard because you're singing in choir or you're blowing an instrument in the band, they're going to want that distancing to be, you know, to be back at six feet. So there is a, there, is a, there are a few uh, details like that. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think what was our challenge was just trying to calculate the number of students for every classroom. If you're sitting at a desk in your class, what's the distancing requirement? And it's uh, it's three feet now, which uh, will really uh, help us uh, accelerate uh, what I think everybody wants to see, uh, more opportunities for in-person instruction uh, at school. When we talk about accelerating it, John, what's the timeline? Because, I mean, we're pretty much almost up against the end of the school year. Is this something that uh, we're looking at rolling out before then? Well, yeah, so again, you know, acceleration always has a different context when you're talking about a big government agency. Right. And so, you know, I don't want to set ex expectations too high. I mean, we you know we applaud our private schools who are able to do this, you know, on a on a dime. Just say, oh, well, tomorrow we can bring everybody in. You know, uh, right now, we, we had our discussion yesterday already. You know, we just, the minute we heard it, we set up a meeting um, with the lieutenant governor. We talked with uh, Vince Ariola at Public Works. Uh, to make sure that we were on the same page and that he's doing his assessment for you know what the guidance means for bus capacity because that'll be critical for us to understand make sure that we don't open all the schools and then the buses are late because we can't fit all the kids on the bus so that's one uh, one thing that he has to go and do uh, some analysis on uh, and we're going to provide him the numbers that we're getting from registration uh, for face-to-face -face for next year so that's one aspect the other part is food service um, so, you know, we had to shift a lot of our food service support to, uh, to, to go away from the meal served in the cafeteria to uh, shelf-stable food items that kids could pick up, you know, families could pick up on Fridays and just have and prepare at home, uh, you know, the rest of the week. So um, that meant that, that our food services company, Sodexo, had to, you know, change their inventory to be able to support that. So to go back to school, depending on the numbers, uh, they're going to have some need some lead time to order the food and make sure there's enough uh, to serve um, in the, the kids who do come to school. So there will there will be some shifting. Um, I mean, some of that those logistics that have to be handled. I think the first priority of the board though is for those students who are face to face today, right now, can we start to increase the number of days that they can come on campus? And that's our that's going to be our first um, um, you know area of decision making that we need to do. So. We're having conversation with the principals this morning at about nine, and then we're, we're heading into spring break. So there's no need to make that change tomorrow and then you know, go to spring break. So we're looking at, you know, when we come back from spring break, will we be able to, to uh, you know, make that shift you know, at that point so that those who are coming to school can at least come to school twice a week, if not more. And that's the uh, the work we're trying to do, um, you know, today, uh, this week, based on the new guidance, and then over the next week or two figure out the food services and bus uh, situation mm -hmm. as well. Um, this is really more important for our school reopening plans because as we were looking at August, we were still looking at six foot distancing. And again, that meant that even if we were very successful, even if the vaccinations happened and there were more students who wanted to go to school or the, or the board wanted to you know, set a mandate for kids to return, uh, we still wouldn't be able to do that physically and so we always had to have, you know, multiple plans uh, to to uh, deal with either, either scenario. 
So the, the fact that we are at three feet now, you know, gives us more, you know, more confidence that we can depend on that, you know, on the three foot scenario for planning purposes. And now we can make some of the further, you know, the, the other decisions that need to happen uh, to meet that goal of returning kids to the classroom. John, how does the three feet uh, thing affect interscholastic sports? Well, uh, we, you know, we're still in discussion, you know, so when the guidance came out, it didn't really, it didn't really get going into too much detail with regard to things like busing uh, and definitely not with interscholastic sports. But, um, you know, we're going to have that discussion because we are looking at fourth quarter sports. And for instance, we, we're pretty confident right now because of the approval for track and field and baseball that those sports can move forward. But we, we did have paddling and, and basketball uh, also planned. So those are the two items that we're going to have to discuss with public health and to see if, uh, if the, the change in guidance also gives us, you know, more confidence that we can hold um, in those competitions uh, safely. So that's, a, that's an ongoing discussion that we need to have. So you've been hosting um, the virtual uh, forums with parents uh, this week. Uh, you might have a, another one. Uh, what's been some of the suggestions, I guess, that you, uh, and feedback and maybe even criticism you've heard from, from parents during uh, these forums? You know, I, 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 was, I was anticipating that there might be a lot more pushback maybe at the forum, you know, um, that, you know, even though we, you know, we don't want to go to school, but, you know, it's not safe yet. And uh, we, you know, this is the wrong time and we're still not going to be safe. Because we heard a lot of that earlier on, you know, early on in the year, you know, sent, you know, comments like I'm never, ever going to send my, you know, kids back to school until there's a hundred percent vaccination. So uh, we didn't hear as much of that, uh, you know, more, um, you know, we didn't hear that kind of strident type of pushback. We did hear concerns about safety. And so, you know, we let the, the parents know that, you know, yes, they have, you know, HEPA filters are going to, are going to be coming in. You know, air filtration, um, the, the work around sanitization of, of, the, of restrooms or the, or the renovation of restrooms, um, you know, the hand washing stations, just all of the safety requirements that will continue and improve at school. Uh, we had to, I think that was one of the areas. If we're going to do this, um, and, you know, especially if we're going to do it next school year, will we have all of the things in place that will help us to feel uh, more comfortable with our kids back? And that's really uh, you know, that is our focus and that's what we've been focused on. So, you know, we, I, I really did, I mean, I started off the parent forum just, you know, um, focusing on what I hope we all can focus on, that we are at a point, you know, with, with, with the community health situation improved and with the vaccination strategy wide open and allowing anybody who wants to come get a vaccine to come and get it, that uh, we have to get our, we have to now talk about getting our kids back in school. There, re there really isn't any other goal. Uh, that's the most important, uh, you know, goal that we have right now. Uh, we have to come to the, come to terms with that reality as teachers and as parents. That if we want to uh, assess, you know, the impact of COVID nineteen on our on our kids, if we want to be in a position to support our kids and get them back on track academically and socially and emotionally, we have to have them back in a routine, back in the school, you know, in a school building in their classrooms. So we can, you know, we can have that uh, full opportunity to interact and um, and 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 really, you know, uh, as a team, support uh, all of our students. It's not going to happen when they're at home, uh, when we are trying to engage, but have limited, uh, you know, really a limited abilities to really fully engage uh, the kids. So, you know, at the end of the day, if we're if we're and we're in a much safer situation than many other states, uh, our our vaccination strategy is. I think a lot more uh, has been a lot more aggressive. We were able to get our educators moved to the front of the line to begin that process. So we really don't have any excuse if you're looking at the rest of the country. If there's anyone in whose position to reopen schools, it's us. And we just need to, to move forward and figure out how we're going to do that. Um, but that's the goal now. Uh, you know, unless the community health situation changes dramatically, our focus is getting those schools open, getting kids back, working with parents and teachers to make sure they're ready for, for when that time comes. Uh, we had a comment here, John, if face-to-face -face extends their days weekly, will all online also extend their days weekly? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's the that's the intent. What we're looking at, 
um, is, is to, you know, the, the challenge for teachers this year was as we tried to accommodate the situations of all families, um, you know, we basically teachers for the, for, for the most part, were looking to figure out how to translate their lessons into three different formats. So they could do some online instruction, uh, they could do face to face, and they could also do the hard copies. And, uh, you know, some schools were, were, you know, they had enough teachers and were able to organize themselves, organize their schedules where, you know, teachers might only be able to focus on online and, and be good with that. But in most other cases, teachers were, were doing two or three models of learning. And so that meant that they had to, to put that extra effort in uh, to, to uh, working in those three models. And it meant we had to provide time during the week to do online, to do face-to-face uh, -face, and to do um, the hard copy because these are the same teachers. We didn't have extra teachers, you know, uh, laying around. So the teachers were basically dividing their time and their efforts to try to support all three. So going into next school year, and the reason why we have a registration uh, process in place uh, right now uh, up until April 9th, uh, we're trying to figure out who still wants to be online so that we can uh, appropriately staff uh, what we hope, what we had planned to be an independent online program for those students that will be completely separate from the face-to-face -face instruction for students who, who show up at school. And that means that these will not be the same teachers. There'll be different teachers doing online and doing face-to-face. -face. And that allows us then to multiply the number of days um, in the classroom and school and also to multiply the online days as well. So the answer is yes. Uh, we do plan to expand instruction, you know, try to maximize instructional time, uh, both for online and for face-to-face -face students. And then that's the way we're trying to accomplish that. Thank you for that, John. Um, where, where are you with um, uh, students with special needs? Because we do have a comment here from, from you know, that's the Well, they're, they're at the front of the line. <laughs> In terms of you know our, the strategy, if if anybody, if any student you know really needs to come back to to school, um, it's going to be our our students who participate in special education, because of the fact that there are many services that that really um, depend on being at school to receive them. And so during the pandemic, especially during the shutdown, uh, that was a challenge. And and so we were very glad for face to face instruction to open, and then students were able to come. Uh, to school and receive those services. Now, not every special education student was able to, you know, was willing to come back for face-to-face -face because of, you know, maybe their medical concerns, health concerns. Um, so, you know, we allowed the parents to make that choice. But as we return, you know, next school year, uh, we hope and we and we would like to work with parents to address any concerns. But we do hope that they will feel and uh, believe that it's safe enough for their kids. You know to to get you know to get back um again it'll take some work with the with their iep teams at school to make sure that if there are any concerns that those can be addressed um but we're working to to bring our kids back and we know that that, that our, our most vulnerable students are our, our, our sped students should be back in school so again with regard to an individual's particular health concerns or medical concerns what what usually happens is in the in the team setting you know, with their teachers and with the administrators and their professionals, uh, looking into see what types of accommodations can be made to facilitate their return to school. Uh, one of the comments we got from our parents was, "Well, you know, there's, you know, what, we know there's going to be continued need for face masking. Um, so, but my my child doesn't, you know, we're still you know, not able to wear that face mask consistently. So, are there ways we can we can uh, return my child to school?" Um, even with that, with that in mind. And so, of course, you know, the option for face shields or for sneeze guards and those types of accommodations are, are options, you know, for us. And, you know, it's just going to depend on the parent and the child and the school team working that out and for everyone to feel comfortable. At the end of the day, there may be families who say, I'm just not comfortable yet. And we understand that, you know, it's just like the vaccinations. There are going to be employees who say, hey, I'm just not ready for that. I don't, I don't know that I, I want to do that yet. So we respect that, but ultimately, you know, our, our uh, message is, you know, our kids need to be back in school if, if they're going to be able to really uh, get the services that they are, that they're owed and, and that we need to provide. So that's, that's our ultimate strategy. Uh, John, I wanted to ask, um, last year at the end of the school year, I know that uh, there was discussion about uh, kind of going easy on the grading because of the pandemic and, you know, the unprecedented 
uh, conditions we're all living in. Is is that a similar conversation happening uh, with the tail end of this school year <laughs> or just grading in general over the last uh, few semesters? Um, no, there's not a discussion. I mean, you know, last year we had we really made the abrupt shift in the fourth quarter, and so we really didn't think it was um, um, made sense to count fourth quarter grades when we were in the middle of transition and shutdown and and all of that. So the grading actually relied on the third quarter grades, you know, going backwards. And so um, that's how the grading was handled last year. Uh, this in this uh, this year we do have a grading policy in place. Uh, we've tried to you know de-emphasize the focus on the grades themselves, you know, from first quarter, third quarter, and so forth. And we do, we did, we did uh, provide grades, um, you know, for uh, the first semester and we plan to for the second semester. Now, again, um, that's been an, an active discussion because we do know that there are a lot of students who have had challenges, you know, accessing their education for one reason or another. You know, there could be all sorts of reasons. And so we recognize this is an unusual year um, so really, the the most critical part is for our is for our high school students. That's that's what really what where the grades matter because those translate into credits towards graduation. So our concern is really not about going easy on the grades. It's really looking at the students in high school who were on track for graduation who may not be on track at this point, and uh, you know ways in which we can allow them to recover those credits. So uh, we'll be looking at the summer for, for some of that work. You know, we talked about expanded summer programs, but that includes you know, ensuring that we target those students who are close to graduation, uh, who may have fallen off track, giving them an opportunity over the summer to complete those credits and hopefully uh, graduate you know, this summer um, if that's possible. So that's really where you know, that, the grading uh, matters. But we also are, you know, again, we're also doing the, the district-wide assessments for face-to-face -face, uh, instruction, and that'll be informative. Um, I mean, in most jurisdictions, they're showing, you know, in some cases, ten, you know, ten-point drops in, um, you know, in, in their, uh, you know, math and uh, English and reading. Um, so they're they're seeing an, an impact, but I think uh, you know the point is not it's not really about, you know, identifying you know kids failed this year. I mean that's kind of a you know, an, an expectation that there's been an impact on learning. The issue is using that data to figure out how we, you know, who, who was, you know, who's really suffering from this, you know, were there certain groups that were uh, disproportionately impacted and uh, taking some of the deep, those, that da those data points and using them to inform our strategies for recovery. So uh, we still have that requirement to do the district wide assessment. And um, I think, you know, we took, I think when the, the secretary of education came on this morning and he echoed that sentiment. You know, it's really, this is really not about grading states and grading school system. This is about figuring out who who got in, who was impacted, you know, by the um, COVID-19 pandemic, how much, how significant was this impact? And then how do we use this data to uh, strategize for interventions, you know, going forward? So it's really interesting. Uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of support now with uh, the federal resources coming in. Uh, there is a there are a couple of uh, well there's another bill out there that that's going to be introduced by the White House focused on um, school infrastructure as well as um, universal pre-k so we're interested to see those bills as well I mean there seems to be a pretty aggressive move to tackle some of these education issues that have been discussed but you know have still been uh, you know still not been able to move forward so uh, we're looking and you know hoping to see those you know, th those resources combined with the national and local strategy to try to get us back on track from, from COVID-19. You, you kind of, you mentioned summer school, so there will be summer school? Uh, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll put out an announcement with the details. We're, we're in the final stages and trying to work out, you know, we need to work out um, you know, as well with the buses, you know, how things are going to work because we, we'd like to do some you know, morning and afternoon sessions and we'd like this available at all schools. So um, I think that's, I think the general framework has been uh, put together and we're just kind of working through some of the operational issues. Uh, we're working, working with the governor's office and you know, they've committed to helping support the, the bus transportation that'll be needed. Uh, you know, that's usually something we have to pay for and you know, just for the, li the limited summer programs that we were doing. Now that we're expanding uh, summer programs uh, and, and you know, doing morning and afternoon sessions, that transportation 
uh, issue is important. So we're grateful for uh, the commitment uh, that the, the Lieutenant Governor has made to try to take care of those costs for us. Uh, John, we had a... Is it, is it only going to be face-to-face? For summer school um i'd have to i'd have to confirm that but i, I think the intent is is to uh to do face to face well what there, about might, there might be some there might be some I mean, online uh, opportunity i'm not you know I, I know that for uh for credit recovery we we did some of that in prior summers but let me i, I need to get those details signed to finalized from the team that's planning and designing the the summer programs okay. are we all done uh, with the laptops for the public school students uh, the laptops are in and they're uh, being distributed to the schools that need them. And so um, we're, we're, you know, we're grateful for that. You know, it's like, it's like checking your Amazon account for the orders and trying to see whether it's really going to come in. It might say it's coming in, but, you know, <laughs> until it's in your hands, there's no counting on it. So I, we, we check, like they came in, they're in the, they're in our possession and we're, are going to be able to distribute them uh, uh, you know, going forward. So the technology is there and that really, you know, the, 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 the MIFIs, again, we're almost, I think we're a couple of days away from the end of that, the 14 day period uh, since we awarded. So that if, if there's no protest in the next 48 hours, we should be able to move forward with that. And again, um, even if we go back face to face, we do envision uh, a, a need for, for those supports uh, going forward, and we, we just we want to integrate technology into our classrooms, and um, you know, and, and also prepare for potential disruption should the community health situation, you know, require that in the future. If if you're at school, for instance, and there is a positive result and you're a contact, when you go home for the 14 days, just as a precaution, we don't want you to go home and be stuck at home doing nothing. We want you to take a laptop home, uh, check into your class, and. You know, um, make sure you have get your assignment to turn your work in. So, um, you know, there's still going to be a role. So that that really gives us a lot of opportunity to ensure that we keep uh, teaching and learning continuous. You know, this coming school year. We had a comment. Uh, will it be mandatory in the future that uh, laptop cameras be turned on for online students? Um, I know that's a that's a discussion. I'm not sure where we'll end up on that. There there are a lot of reasons both ways, and a lot of districts going here that do both. Uh, you know, there's still going to be a that really gives us a lot of opportunity. Yeah, so there, yeah, there's still, um, there's still a, um, you know, discussion about whether that should be required or not. Um, haven't really settled on that. And, and you know, again, this is, you know, we're still moving. This is, these, this has been sort of an interim period. We have to get to a point, and I know the board has been talking with us about this, where we do need to set policy about distance learning. You know, looking into the future. You know, what is that distance learning policy going to be? Uh, we know that this is an emergency period, so we've been very flexible. But going forward, there are discussions that we're having, um, you know, stem from from things like should we, you know, should it be available to all grades? Uh, should it be, um, you know, should it be available for all subjects? Um, I know that we've been talking with Dr. Okada over at GCC, and we're talking about how you do, you know, the CTE classes uh, that require hands-on, you know, experience without uh, you know requiring face to face so there's a lot of there are a lot of reasons why online works and where and also a lot of reasons that a lot of areas where online might not be the best way to to um, you know to deliver instruction so we're going to have to work on a longer term policy um, and answer questions like that with regard to you know cameras being on cameras not being off just to make sure that we can account for attendance engagement and and so forth thanks John thanks John you good yeah okay appreciate your uh, time it was a big one all right well thank you and um you know we're happy to keep the community uh engaged and abreast of the new information so i you know from here to the start of next school year um you know we know that our parents are going to be really interested in making sure they understand what's coming so uh thank you for the opportunity to come on again of okay. course uh, john for next week's uh, interview it's going to be holy week so we're going to have to whisper the whole thing all right <laughs> I'm, I'm prepared for that. Or maybe in writing, we can write it and then you just show your answer to the <laughs> We'll do. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> uh, good morning. 